Good morning, everybody. My name is Marek Ranis, and uh, with Janet Williams, we are hosting our Friday lecture series. Today, we have a very different guest um, after a series of many artists. Today, we're actually going to host a curator. Carla Hansel is the Vice President of Public Art for the Arts and Science Council, which administers the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Art Ordinance. She is an author and curator based in Charlotte and has over 25 years of experience commissioning, commissioning artworks and organizing museum exhibitions. She served as a curator of modern and contemporary art at Mint Museum from 2002 to 2012 and is currently board member of International Sculpture Center. Welcome to UNCC and thank you, Carla, for joining us. Really thank you, Mark. Uh, well, it's really a pleasure to be with you all today um, to share a little bit about um, the work that we're doing with public art. Um, I understand there's some questions about curating. Um, so I'll start in with the presentation and then uh, we'll have time for questions uh, toward the last 15 minutes or so. Um, but I'm really delighted to be able to share with you um, the work that we do, myself and a team of other project managers at Arts and Science Council, uh, to manage the public art program. Um, and it's housed within the Arts and Science Council and the mission of ASC is to really ensure an excellent, relevant and sustainable cultural community in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, the vision is to create a vibrant cultural life for all. And we really want to serve as a resource hub. So the uh, scope of ASC is really large. It's not only Charlotte, but it's also the surrounding communities um, it's Mecklenburg County, and then the towns of Cornelius, Davidson, Huntersville, Matthews, Mint Hill, and Pineville. Um, so in terms of our public art program, it really, um, ASC has been managing it since the 90s, but in the late 90s, uh, we commissioned a study about um, how funding could be more sustainable and more, um, I guess, uh, consistent for public art. And uh, we did a lot of research in terms of uh, ordinances that are within other cities. And this is actually a law that goes on the books that enables funding to come from a percent of construction budgets. So um, after that study, um, the ASC put together a proposal to uh, have an ordinance passed for both the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County that would enable 1% of capital improvement projects or construction budgets to be able to go toward commissioning of art. And um, at that time, you know, Charlotte was really a growing city. They were trying to keep up with other cities in the South and um, other cities, even nationally. It was as um, Charlotte was beginning to become a banking center as Bank of America was headquartered here. So the status of having art and having a really beautiful city um, that showed that it was progressive and that there's, you know, art was really a goal um, of this place. So I guess ASC's planning and then Charlotte's vision, the county's vision all coalesced in 2002, 2003, when the ordinances were passed by both the city and county. Um, and then each year ASC um, is engaged in a contract to manage um, the commissioning of the artwork. So we pull together um, artist selection panels. We uh, place the calls for artists um, once the artist is uh, selected by a really diverse artist selection panel that includes community members, then we engage the artist, get them under contract and oversee um, all of the design steps uh, from concept to schematic to final design. Uh, we help oversee the fabrication, installation, and then um, make sure that there are plans to keep it maintained uh, for the next 20 years. So um, of course, when working with public and, and when trying to get buy-in for, for any work that you do, it's really important to consider, you know, what your funders goals are, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a gallerist, you know, museum, you know, re what really are the goals and how, how does your work intersect? So in creating the ordinance, there were really specific goals and guidelines that were set, set for um, the public art program. So, these were set back in 2002. They're still really relevant um, to pro promote the cultural heritage and artistic development of the city to enhance the city's character and identity. Um, so obviously now there's a lot of discussion about equity and inclusion. So I think there's even more opportunities to explore identities that are, haven't always been brought to the fore. 
um, to contribute to economic development and tourism. Um, you know, beautiful cities, beautiful places help drive tourism and commerce. I know that when Amazon was looking for its next um, site and headquarters, they were really looking at what areas had a lot of, um, you know, art things going on. Um, and Charlotte, I think, is burgeoning, but you know, we didn't we didn't didn't get that contract. Um, so I think that's also something that's on the city's radar. Uh, public art, art also um, is meant to add warmth, dignity, beauty, and accessibility to public spaces. Um, I really am motivated by the accessibility part of public art. Um, having spent a lot of my career, you know, working in museums um, where sometimes I realize that there is a barrier for people to come through the doors and feel like they're welcome into the galleries. Whereas when things are in the public domain or the public commons, you know, it's, uh, there's an open invitation to experience and to interact with the artwork. So um, obviously that ties into the final goal of expanding the citizens and the experience and participation of, um, we probably need to change the, the citizens to um, res you know, residents or individuals with the visual arts. Um, and then we also feel that public art can really serve as a catalyst for connectivity. And I want to talk about the sculpture that's presented here because I, I really have a really close tie with this one. Um, it's the first big project um, that I was able to bring to completion. And it's a sculpture in Romare Bearden Park by um, the Chicago artist, Richard Hunt. Um, he's really a significant uh, artist that um, does small scale and large scale welded sculpture. Um, he started out actually as a high school student. And by the time he was in his early thirties, he was invited to have a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. And this was in 1972. Um, it happened to also be the same time that Romare Bearden was also invited to have a solo exhibition. And these two artists really broke um, the color barrier of, of you know, contemporary living artists of color being able to be shown um, in New, one of New York's finest contemporary um, museums. So Richard Hunt was, do, at that point, he was doing um, small welded sculptures with found objects and they were inspired by, by mythological um, characters. And then Richard, I mean, and then Romare Bearden was doing his collages, many of them inspired by his memories and associations with Mecklenburg County. So then go full circle to, um, 2015, uh, Richard Hunt was commissioned to do this artwork uh, for Romare Bearden Park and was really, you know, he'd known Bearden, they had exhibited together. So he decided to make this sculpture as a tribute to his friend Bearden and it's called Spiral Odyssey because Bearden also did a collage series based on um, Odysseus, Odysseus's um, Odyssey uh, by Homer. And then um, I think the other thing that Richard Hunt really wanted to um, touch upon was Romare Bearden's desire to create opportunities for other artists by um, having the Spiral Group, which was an artist collective um, that was established during the civil rights movement. And his intent was to create a really large artwork for the March on Washington doing a collage. Well, it kind of turned out that Bearden was the main one interested in collage because he couldn't get his other art friends necessarily to do the same project, but it, it transformed his work. Um, and the, the goal of the spiral group was to expand upward and outward. And he really did create more opportunities for artists of color to be shown in museums and galleries and, um, and have more opportunities for exhibition. So this, um, the sculpture is abstract, but there are various elements of growth and expansion that you can see within it. Um, Hunt also wanted to reference the Middle Passage um, from Africa to the New World and how um, horrendous that experience was. So there's also at the bottom of the sculpture, sort of a form that reference, references a boat and um, kind of a journey as well as tying it to um, you know, the journey that's in the Iliad and Odyssey. So um, I'm just gonna highlight some of our recent projects so you know a little bit about the type of projects that we've recently completed, um, the variety of materials and um, intents and placement of the work. 
So uh, most recently we've created uh, this beautiful pavilion called Nested Hive, and it was done by the artist team uh, Recite out of Houston. Um, this gives you a little bit better perspective, but it was created out of Ipe wood um, and held together by various bolts and metal panels. So it came in over 10,000 pieces that had to be assembled on site and all put together. Um, but we, this is now in the new um, Eastway Regional Recreation Center, which has like swimming pools, soccer courts, um, ceramic studios, uh, pickleball courts. It's gonna be really a full service uh, recreation center. And they hope to also do um, outdoor classes. So this can also serve as a, a site where those classes can take place. It's gonna be near a pollinator garden. So I think that was another reference why they wanted the hive. Um, and then also the idea of Charlotte, um, you know, being during the Revolutionary War that, you know, the, the, the patriots here were tough fighters and it was, you know, that was like attacking the hornet's nest. So they fought back. And um, so the hornet's nest has remained one of Charlotte's symbols. And here's a better view of it. So this um, center will open to the public in the this summer. Um, we're hope, hopeful that COVID numbers will be down enough that uh, there will be kind of staged entries and people will be able to experience and come to the center and experience the artwork. Um, open Book, Open Mind um, is another recent sculpture that was completed last October. And it's by artist Jim Gallucci, who's based in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, he did community engagement with uh, various people that um, came to his uh, lectures. And, well, I guess it wasn't really a lecture, it was a workshop um, to discuss um, the titles that really inspired them, book titles, um, as well as coming up with um, a title for the sculpture. So he wanted to create a welcoming archway um, into this renovated library. And um, it looks like the ribbons actually are appear like open books. And then um, titles are um, cut into the uh, metal panels so that when the sun streams through them from above, it's actually projected onto the, the uh, pavement below. Um, and there are benches so people can sit there and kind of uh, look up at the panels and, you know, feel kind of like this welcoming presence as they uh, move into the library. Um, Pillars of Dreams is maybe one of our most ambitious works. Um, it was created by Mark, Mark Fornes. Um, he's an exhibiting artist uh, as well as an, an architect. And he has um, an atelier in New York um, called The Very Many. Um, and this is kind of a reference to the many individual parts that make up his sculptures. Um, he was a mathematician as, as well as um, an architect, and he's very um, driven by computational design. I know that um, UNC Charlotte also um, has you know, a faculty member that teaches computational design, and she was very aware of his work also. Um, so each individual part is designed in a three-dimensional program, um, you know, digitally, so that he literally knows exactly what the artwork is going to look like before it's even fabricated, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this particular sculpture is made out of aluminum sheets that are like a sixteenth of an inch um, thick. So they're super thin, super flexible, and there are three layers that kind of create structural integrity. Um, as well as using kind of the curved form, you know, as you all know that that's uh, the curve or the egg shape is really one of the most structurally sound forms. So um, that's in part what holds it together and then it's tethered on these nine legs. Um, here it is from a top view and um, it's meant to be a, a, a welcoming place for people that use this new center. Um, it houses a lot of Mecklenburg's County's family services and children who are separated um, from their families and caregivers. Um, he's envisioning that perhaps this would be the site where they have a more happy reunion as that handoff is made. Um, so that was one of his um, inspiring concepts as he worked on the design. 
Um, here you can get, get a sense of the scale. So the exterior looks white, but the interior has more colored panels. So it, it uh, moves in a gradation from kind of the soft, um, gentle pink into you know, lighter blues and darker blues as you go up into the volumes of, of the vaults. So it's, I think it's just really spectacular. Um, it's off Freedom Drive and Ashley Road. It's at the side of the old Freedom Mall. Um, so I would really encourage you all to take a trip out there. Um, it's put, it was assembled on site from um, a team from France. It was actually uh, fabricated in the US um, in um, Indianapolis. And then all the indip individual parts were shipped to France to coat with a special long-term coating um, at a facility there. And then he um, sent those, uh, the people that coded the work from France to come and install it on site. So it was um, installed during one of the coldest, rainiest uh, Februarys in 1999, um, but it was all put together with these individual rivets um, and just was built up like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. puzzle. Uh, Buster Simpson is another artist um, that was inspired, was inspired by the Lotta Nature Preserve. Um, he is based in Seattle, and this is inspired by the idea of a dousing rod looking for water. So it can spin 360 degrees um, on this ball bearing, as well as tip up and down very gently. It's also close to the Raptor Center, um, so the form also references a bird. Um, he is known for a lot of environmental work. So this is uh, more of a, an object uh, than his usual work that's usually more integrated into architecture. Um, there again, one of the challenges of public art is um, working harmoniously with architects. And um, even though you know, we were given access to the plans, they really didn't want any of the artwork to touch their building. <laughs> so we found a, a, another site uh, for the artists to be able to complete another artwork um, that would also reference the goal of that, of that place. Okay. And then uh, Stacy Levy also worked at another um, nature center. This is Stevens Creek Nature Preserve. She created a walkway that's going out um, into wetland areas. And this will open to the public again later um, this year. And here's another up close detail of that. So some of the artwork can be really functional. Carla, I'm, okay, um, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize you all saw that. Um, some of the artwork can be really functional. So this is this is a pathway. Um, this is in, was taken in um, like early December. So it looks really bleak, but there will be marshes and other things that will be growing out of this area. And then Hornet's Nest um, is an artwork that was done by Michael Morgan, where he literally um, worked with individuals to help shape these uh, kind of soft, um, blocks or bricks um, that were made of clay. So individuals' handprints and footprints were collected. And then um, he formed them into this, again, reference to a, a muddy hornet's nest and that was used uh, within the facade of the building. Um, local artists, Laurel Holtzapple and Sean Cassidy did an artwork for Reed Neighborhood Park, again, using you know relatively simple casting techniques. Um, to create an entryway um, that referenced some of the, the gardens that were located there with uh, side views of okra. And then um, with some of the stones that were placed on site, there were cast benches that was like a cross section of an okra plant. And then uh, there used to be a stream on this site. So this is also a bench that's titled Living Stream. Um, we also do really major projects at Charlotte's Airport. Um, this is an artwork by artist Christian Moeller. Um, he teaches at UCLA. And um, this is a kinetic artwork that spins very slowly at about eight RPMs or reputation, uh, revolutions per minute. And um, it's, it was inspired by the holding patterns of airplanes as they're circling above the airport and waiting to land. So he envisioned what the contrails would look like. So it's, um, you know, a series of loops and they spin counter, one spins clockwise, one spins counterclockwise. So there's also kind of this interacting dance that the two do as well. 
Um, the clear story window is a northern exposure. And uh, we've also arranged the lights so that um, the artwork will project on the opposite side. So it also creates a very um, low tech animation. So this is a kind of soothing sculpture in the new food court area um, off the East Terminal. Um, so it's also created from a five inch diameter aluminum tube. And to be able to bend this tube without creating any kinks or ripples, you actually had to engage SpaceX um, because of their high pressure um, water that they use to fabricate some of the rockets and various parts of you know, the, space, the space program. Um, so he utilized that to technology to create this artwork. I thought that was also a nice tie um, to aviation and the history of history and the um, not only the history, but the uh, future of aviation. And um, Rafik Anadol was actually one of Christian Moeller's students. Um, he's uh, originally from Turkey, and he is also interested in um, design and uh, making digital data um, at, as a visual object. So he has five dedicated servers that collect various data from the airports. Um, one thing is, you know, the amount of luggage that goes on, on the luggage belts, um, the amount of cars that are parked, um, the planes, you know, kind of can data about planes that are taking off and landing. Um, and then uh, I think also, um, the individuals that um, are booking through the American Airlines. So this is uh, a really huge data installation. It's over 300 feet long. Um, just gonna quickly run through some other images. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the public art process and then I want to leave enough time you know, for discussion and questions. Um, so once the artist is under contract, we put them through their paces um, in terms of really working through the design process. So the concept design is really where the initial ideas um, take place after the artist meets with the project team. Um, so usually it consists of drawings, an initial preliminary budget, and then the artist's statement. So um, for example, on the right, this was the initial concept design for the Pillars of Dreams by Mark Fornes. Um, as part, because of our, our um, artwork is funded by um, agencies, city and county, um, and does have bond funding, we want to always have um, input from the community. So having community engagement is always a step that we require in our contracts. Um, so usually after the artist develops the concept design, we, we uh, develop some way of engaging uh, people that will work, that will um, experience the artwork to be able to have um, some sort of input on um, you know, the design of the artwork and, uh, and also just have dialogue so they know what's coming into their community and can feel more engaged in the process. Schematic design is really when the concept gets fleshed out um, with greater detail. So it usually consists of more scale drawings um, an estimated budget with quotes. So we really know exactly what um, the artwork is gonna cost, a list of materials, a description um, of how it's gonna be fabricated and also a timeline so that we can ensure it's gonna be completed on time and on budget. And then by the time we get to the final design, um, that's really similar to like in an architectural project when the construction documents are ready to go to bid. Um, because our artwork is in the public domain, um, we also have to be sure that it's structurally sound. So we always require an engineer to um, stamp drawings to um, ensure that it can withstand the elements and be safe. Um, we ask for the final budget um, and then a finalized schedule. And then it goes into fabrication. Um, this is in Richard Hunt's studio when he was fabricating uh, Spiral Odyssey. So sometimes we pay visits to the artist. So I was able to do that uh, to see a studio in Chicago. And then installation. Um, so this is where um, the artist comes on site, sometimes with a big crane um, to literally uh, erect the artwork at the location. 
um, stabilize it to the foundation and um, get it ready for, for the public presentation. So uh, that basically completes you know, this part of my presentation. If any of you have questions, um, you know, this is my email and phone number. You can always go to the arts and science website and then specifically see um, the, our programs. And then uh, public art is also featured on um, ASC's Instagram account. Um, so you might wanna follow that as well. Um, so ASC Charlotte. So that's it for now. So happy to take questions. Carla, thank you very much for this uh, ins very inspiring presentation, but also probably very intimidating presentation, um, a number of uh, amazing large projects. So looking at your presentation from the perspective of students who are definitely thinking now about their future careers and how they can maybe even possibly engage in public art, mm -hmm. what would you advise them now as they are about to finish or in the middle of their studies, how they can prepare themselves for possibility of such a career? Is there is a career actual, one can support themselves, you know, through life? Um, and just talk in general terms about, <clears throat> you know, artists, young artists who are uh, worried about their future, thinking about studio art is attractive, but how can I support myself? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should do graphic design, maybe I should do, uh, you know, uh, game design. Yeah, so um, it's always, I think it's always great to have a studio background because you're already tied to making things and the thought process of, of thinking about how to construct or make or design things is really a great um, training for the, the brain and creativity and problem solving. So I think um, just val valuing those skills of creating and problem solving um, that's super important. Um, most of the, you know, I will say that public art is very different from just a straight studio practice. Um, the artist really is part of a whole team um, with planners, architects, designers. So it's really um, a lot about knowing, you know, especially with the three-dimensional built uh, projects, it's really important to know a little bit about um, structural soundness, um, how to make things, and but also how to think about making them structurally sound so that they can exist, you know, for you know a long period of time. Um, I know some artists that have gotten into the public art realm by working on things as simple as um, like working in a community garden and then building things, you know, to augment that garden, whether it's an artist design bench or, you know, signage or um, sculptural elements, you know, you can, and there are, are grants that the city offers, you know, to really enhance communities with things like um, community gardens. That's, that's kind of an easy point of entry. Um, We've also done a project at the airport. I didn't show slides this time, but we've worked with artists who are primarily known for doing two-dimensional work, paintings or prints. And um, we've found a way to enlarge um, the artist's original design of a, a painting, um, enlarge it through high resolution photography and then print it onto a highly durable material um, called Acrovin. Um, it's used a lot on hospital walls. Um, so that is a durable finish um, that can go directly on the gate at the gates at the airport. Um, so that's also a way that we're doing public art. Um, we've worked with some local artists who uh, do ceramics mosaic. So it's a in that case, it would be a matter of partnering with someone that knows how to do the armature, you know, the structure, and then uh, creating a surface to apply the mosaics. So that's another. Um, way of doing it. But I would say, you know, it's really important to think that public arts really have to engage with a lot of people. And sometimes you don't always get your exact vision um, to go forward. There are sometimes a lot of compromises that have to take place, whether it's, you know, making your idea fit into the budget or, um, you know, the siding has to change. So maybe, maybe the scale and scope of your work has to change. So doing public art really requires a lot of um, flexibility, um, but it can be a really 
I think, a good career path. Um, a lot of people that do public arts, you know, they, they're like a small business owner. Um, sometimes they have a team of other people as their, as their practice gets larger and they can have studio assistants that can assist them. Um, but there's also a lot of work in looking for the opportunities, applying for them, getting them, um, and then having the time, you know, to really manage the production and the creation and installation. Um, I would say, um, in terms of, of thinking about the, the future, um, a lot of times being an artist requires you to um, look at all, all of your skills and kind of almost cut, your, cut what you can do into pieces of pie. Um, you know, in some cases you might have a studio practice where you do exhibitions, um, maybe you work for another artist or learn um, help with fabrication. Maybe you want to even work for a construction company for a period of time, learn more about architecture, um, learn by hands-on about how things are made. Um, maybe you want to you know, intern at a museum or an art space, so you learn more about that side of things. Um, it's just, I mean, school is one thing, but getting kind of like the practical hands-on through apprenticeships, through internships, um, through looking at other ways to really build your skills and connections, um, that's always a really good way to think about how to move forward. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this was very helpful. Uh, and question which kind of re relates to the first one from many students, uh, how one becomes a curator? Uh, how would you advise uh, young people who have an interest in, um, in the discipline and what kind of skills, what kind of maybe even mm -hmm. personal trait characteristics require uh, to become a curator? Right. So I would say that to be a curator, it's kind of a, like right now, it looks like a really glamorous path. You know, you get to hang out in museums and, you know, meet with artists and collectors and put together shows. Um, but there is a pretty strong skill set that um, is required to be able to do that work. And it always begins um, with understanding the process of making and um, concept, you know, understanding the process of conceptual art and having a really strong appreciation, um, understanding and, um, you know, admiration for artists, because really curators are really nothing without the artist. So it has to be kind of a, um, you know, curators, I guess, can really champion some artists and some ideas, but really without the artist, um, the curator really <laughs> isn't there. So um, I think skills, you know, the skills of discernment are really important, you know, knowing how to discern, you know, good, better, best. Um, knowing how to um, kind of understand what the artist is trying to convey and then really working on communication skills, whether it's writing or speaking to be able to talk about that and also make it really accessible to the people that will experience the art. Um, I think one of the things that has always been a hallmark of my curatorial practice is that I never wrote for other curators or other art historians. I always would try to write so my writing was really clear and concise. Um, and I think that that's really helped me, you know, be able to continue to work in a lot of, a lot of different venues. Um, you know, and being a curator, I've, I've had to learn everything from, you know, the registration side of things, how to install art, you know, how to, um, you know, advise on shipping, transportation, how to advise on making footings for the artwork. Um, and I started really early on, I think I was only a sophomore in college when I had my first internship at a museum and um, I offered to write an educational guide for the sculpture garden. So it happened to be at University of Nebraska, the Sheldon um, Gallery and Museum, it was a beautiful, Philip Johnson building with uh, a really great sculpture garden and a pretty significant collection, you know, for being a university gallery in the Midwest. So that's how I got my foot in the door and then just kept, you know, kept going. 
So definitely uh, uh, writing skills. Mm -hmm. Writing and communication is really important. Yeah. Um, question following up on the on the curatorial, but not only. Uh, what is the difference between curating for the museum or a large institution or becoming independent curator and maybe question which is kind of connected to it. What are the greatest challenges in your curatorial, but also in your practice as a art, public art administrator? Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Okay, um, so the first part, um, okay, so what are my greatest, I, I guess I'll go with what are my greatest challenges. Um, so some of the greatest challenges are just working with a lot of different personalities and trying to keep everyone content and calm. <laughs> you know, in doing public art, you have to work with the architect, the artists, um, the city planners. Um, sometimes you have to get permits from the state or city. So it's just, it's really um, trying to keep uh, your ego in check when things uh, ultimately hit bumps, whether it's, you know, the budget, whether it's, um, you know, a delay in the construction schedule, whether for whatever reason the artist can't, you know, get the design finalized. Um, they're just, you really have to um, focus on the goal. And I tell this to all my project managers that your goal is to help the artist create his or her best work. And that is, you know, that's what your goal is. And you just have to keep sight of that. Um, for the construction team, the artwork is only a very small, it's like 1% of the budget. So it's not even important to them. But you have to keep advocating and keep making the path clear for the artists. So just dealing with those challenges. Um, in terms of moving from being in the museum to independent curating, again, it's like creating your, uh, being an independent business person. So there again with um, independent curating, um, I had to look again, what I advise you all about how to divide yourself into a pie. I also had to look at how I divided myself into a pie. So uh, part of what I did is corporate art consulting and you know that paid better than being able to just you know get a contract with a museum that already has a curatorial staff um, to do exhibitions. Um, so the exhibition side of things were not as well paid as um, doing arts advising. So I, I kind of balanced out the thing that I really loved, which was curating with knowing how to put um, individuals in connection with, um, you know, sellers of artwork and um, helping build a collection. I also knew how to do registration work. So I worked with some collectors about getting um, their collection all in a database. Um, and then, you know, one of the, I worked on writing a master plan for the light factory. So that was a skill, um, you know, I'd done strategic planning within organizations, but then uh, working on doing a strategic plan for an institution, that was a new skill set that I learned. But um, those are just, you know, you would think like, oh, you just get, <clears throat> being an independent curator, you just get to like put out these ideas and do shows. But no, it's, it's, that's hard work as well. You have to you know, figure out all the streams of revenue and um, how you can make it work. Um, whereas being in a museum there, again, you have to work with an exhibition schedule with other curators um, that also are pushing their ideas and creating a balance within the exhibition schedule. Um, you know, fundraising, I always had to fundraise for the shows I did and the acquisitions I made, you know, so there was a lot of fundraising work, writing grants, I had to write you know, grant. So there's always the, no matter what you do, there's always the money side and the rationale side, you know, there's not just a pure creativity. Yeah. I think that, that the litany of obligations, skills and uh, tasks re required to do this job as kind of was very important for you to mention, because many, mm -hmm. many people imagine, oh, you just hanging the paintings on the wall. Yeah. And you, and you choose them according to your, to your taste. And this is a question from Alan and actually connects also to the, the idea how people imagine curators sometimes people compare curators to movie directors on some level although i, I do see the difference have you altered the viewpoint of the artist uh, or or changed the way art was particular art was presented uh, how how you define this line between 
working with the artist and kind of appreciating his creativity and sometimes creating some kind of influence or changing um, elements of the exposition of artwork itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so probably I'm thinking about, um, you know, lighting and uh, there is a lot of staging and how you present the artwork. So <laughs> probably the most theatrical thing that I ever did was working with Dale Chihuly. Like he literally had the um, paint sample, like this was the perfect neutral shade of gray that all the walls had to be painting. He brought his own lighting designer because glass only works when light is, is transmitted through it. So um, it was really, you know, it was almost set up as like stage design. So I really learned a lot from that. I learned from other senior curators about um, vantage points and how to set sight lines. Um, so those are just kind of some basic things about how to transform an interior space. Um, and working with the artist, Robert Lazzarini, he wanted um, his artwork to look like it was in a very sterile white box and he demanded um, fluorescent lighting and a particular um, paint. I think it was, uh, you know, some paint from London. Um, that one about set the, the installation crew around the bend at the mint at the time because they, you know, they'd never seen an artist really demand a particular, you know, a particular look. So there was kind of a uh, conflict between the installation designer and the artist, but I prevailed and the art, the art again, that's always been my vision, help the, the artist has to help them do their best work. And the presentation was part of the um, exhibition. Um, so that did work. It was, you know, this really intense, um, sterile environment that, but it did create a more meditative um, space for the presentation of the artist's work. Um, and another artwork with Whitfield Lavelle, I really trans, we transferred the galleries into uh, kind of a feeling of the dismal swamp. We created like this swamp type environment. We used auditory sounds and, um, so, I mean, it's, there is a theatrical aspect to exhibition planning and exhibition design. And it's always good to make friends with your exhibition designer and consider them a partner in the process. Mm -hmm. um, changing subject a little bit, focusing more on the, on the relation between the artists and curators. And uh, uh, what do you think? This is a question from Anya. What, what are few things the galleries or curators are looking for when they look at for the artwork? What makes the artist stand from the others? So in other words, mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult question because yeah. the, it, it's a very subjective idea, but what are you looking for when you look at art and artists? I always, I'm always looking for the quality of the ideas. And also I'm still, um, a, a bit, you know, I'm a real stickler for things being crafted well. I mean, some curators aren't, but that's one of my particular bents <laughs> that um, I like really well-made things or I like really well thought out conceptual ideas um, because there's a lot of crap out there, <laughs> excuse me. And it's just, it's like the things that you can really, when you have that discernment, you can really from, and it, it really comes from looking at a lot of things over many, many years. Um, you develop that discerning aspect of yourself where you can, the judging quality um, is something that happens. Um, and I also think even, you know, really well seasoned artists, they're always changing and there's always aspects of their artwork that they don't like. Um, so also as an artist, you have to just be, you know, don't be terrified about creating things or, you know, I'm trying to create something that, you know, a gallerist will like or a curator will like. You really have to start, you know, creating the space to value your own ideas and your own creativity and the, and, you know, be willing to fail because you have to start um, out being bad at something before you can get better about something, especially if you grow. You know, you can kind of get your one stick and keep going, but to really keep, um, you know, keep your practice fresh, you have to be able to change. And I think it's also to really surround yourself with a community of people who are supportive. 
um, because it's kind of, it's terrifying, you know, to just reside in that creative space without um, people that can help um, fuel your sense of well being. So I think that's also a really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, question from, from Nicole, which is kind of very more practical question. Uh, when one approaches gallery or curator, um, or it's already in relationship with the gallery in curator, uh, what are the do what are the don'ts and do's? I mean, what how would you advise young people who are trying to get into the gallery or have mm -hmm. already established some relationship? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of practical tips in the in the. You know. Yeah. So I mean, um, I think it's always good to be very professional. Um, you know, you know, start a start a communication and a very. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be super formal, but in writing, you know, your emails or um, a letter, uh, make sure you don't have spelling errors that your sentences, I mean, this sounds really basic, but you'd be surprised that there sometimes there isn't a lot of attention paid to communication. Um, so, you know, ask for even like an informational interview or ask, you know, maybe direct them to your website or to your Instagram account if you're posting um, your artwork there. Uh, make sure that you know how to take good photos of your artwork. Um, probably Mark and other people are teaching you how to do that, especially with, you know, the requ requirement of doing a lot of critiques on Zoom. So, you know, I'm sure maybe even knowing how to do that is important. Um, having a really concise artist statement about what your intent is. Um, so I think, again, just, you know, being professional, being respectful of their time, being on time, if you do get an appointment, just all of those things, you know, that can show that you're a worthy, you know, trustworthy person and on your game. I think all of that, all of that helps. I mean, it sounds really basic, but it's really not basic because there, there are a lot of people that can't do that. <laughs> Very good advice. Uh, this question is from Olivia and I would kind of expand this question. Do you feel like there is something special, different about the artwork? that Charlotte-based artists create, but I will kind of expand on this. Um, how would you describe the art scene in Charlotte? What's going on right now? What is the future? You know, there are some galleries are closing over the years, some are opening new. Um, what, is, what, is, what is the situation right now uh, in Charlotte? In, you know, talking about artists and type of work, but also the, the market itself, the scene itself. Wow, so this is, this is something that I probably, I, you know, I can't say that I have my finger on the pulse of the Charlotte art scene because I really don't, you know, I'm too uncool to be that person, you know. Um, but in a way, I don't want to be that person because I kind of don't care about what's trendy and what's kind of, I mean, I love that there, there seems to be a lot more vibrant art, art scene and opportunities. Like I really, um, am delighted to see what's happening at Camp North End. Um, I think, you know, that that's a really vibrant place uh, for local artists. Um, I think there, there's more um, opportunities for social practice work in Charlotte. I think that that's something that can, a lot more um, opportunities to do that sort of work. I think there's opportunities for installation. I've, I've really liked um, seeing what was done at the Whitewater Center um, with Meredith Conley's uh, installation and what currently is happening along um, the rail trail with temporary artwork. I think that's something that our program is going to do more of is um, temporary art projects and looking at ways of kind of helping with the capacity building so that people are interested, who are interested in getting into public art kind of have an on-ramp to understand how to get um, into that process. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about working on is the Cross Charlotte Trail. We have artwork that's gonna be placed at various um, entry points to the trail. There's also opportunities for temporary artwork there. Um, a lot of murals are being done. Um, I, I feel like murals really add a lot of vibrancy, but I also don't want us to be the type of city where so many surfaces are just covered with murals because I think, you know, you can get kind of um, retina fatigue, you know, just looking at 
at that many murals and some are good and some are bad. Um, but there are some really high quality ones. Um, you know, even when I was in Washington, DC, some of the curators and artists that I really admired, they would find warehouses and just like kind of host their own spaces. So I, I look, I kind of wonder, you know, as people are coming back to work in the city, if there might be some underutilized spaces that might be able to be made open to artists. Um, and then even ASC's new, um, our home in the um, Packard place, you know, I really want us to be able to have, you know, kind of exhibitions within that space from time to time of local artist work. So I think it's also, I think there's a lot of room for artists kind of taking, um, taking the reins in their own hands of making spaces for exhibition. And, you know, in a way curators are starting to act more like artists and artists are starting to act more like curators. So kind of that intersection, I think is really exciting. Thank you. Uh, maybe last question, which kind of bring us back to our contemporary times. This is a question from Amber. Can you talk about some of the challenges that museums and collectors and art administrators are facing right now in the current political changes? Do you foresee changes in how museums deal with parts of their collections and programming and you know, all the controversial issues? I think we are kind of, I believe we are facing big, um, big changes in the art industry in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there probably are going to be changes. I mean, one of the biggest aspects of museums is attendance. You know, like are museums relevant? Do, pe do people want to go through the doors? Um, the, you know, and how, how are, you know, it's kind of what I talked about before. Like um, there is that barrier of going through the doors to a museum um, for some people where they just don't feel like they're welcome. Like it's considered a very, it can be considered a very elitist sort of place. Um, I think a lot of our museums are trying to change that uh, perception um, and trying to make it more accessible, having free nights and um, showing uh, more work from the community. So it feels more like it's a community sort of institution, um, you know, but it takes a, it's, it's, it takes a lot of resources to maintain a collection. You know, there's a lot of storage, there's a lot of climate control. Um, and then also there's uh, the need to make it accessible. So I think there's, there are more ways of making the collection available online um, to be able to make it accessible for educational purposes. Um, I think, you know, making connections, this was something I was always interested in is making connections between the historical objects and more contemporary ob objects and showing um, some of the parallel thoughts that, that went into um, the ideas behind the two things. So I think making objects relevant to contemporary day practice. Um, and then I think also just the idea, I think social practice um, where artists are dealing with really pressing social issues is going to be something um, that museums need to engage with more. Uh, just maybe quick follow up because just this question came out in uh, in the chat room. So everybody talks about now more about social practice as a more important uh, form of engagement with the community, with the audience. And there's a lot of confusion what social practice is. You know, people say I, I pen mural with the community members. It's a social practice. Uh, what do you think is a good social practice? What what will define uh, mm -hmm. actual good engaging social practice uh, work? Um, to my mind, it, it, you know, some, some of it's even like conceptually based. Um, so I always go all the way back to Mary Jane Jacobs. Um, she was at uh, the, the Art Institute of Chicago and um, she did this exhibition. I always remember it was um, artists that literally created like hydroponic gardens um, to have fresh vegetables for AIDS patients. And this was like in the nineties. Um, and then just doing, you know, other things were, um, and then she did also did this exhibition in places with a past, uh, for the Spoleto festival in Charleston. And this was, um, where she kind of looked at historical buildings and, and, um, invited artists to 
do artwork that talked about the history of those buildings. I think with Charlotte being a segregated town, um, I think there's a lot of history that could be uncovered in really um, interesting ways and celebrating some of the history, like with the Brooklyn neighborhood, we're doing some projects that are really relevant to that with Pearl Street Park, um, where some of the Brooklyn, Brooklyn's history is being the African-American you know, city within a city that was basically demolished, you know, shortly after 1968 to make way for the um, beltway that went through Charlotte. I mean, this was a really typical urban design practice that, you know, had horrendous effects in terms of um, tearing down, you know, really um, whole community and, you know, spreading families and, and friends and neighborhoods and or not neighborhoods, but just, you know, close connections. And um, so I think there's a lot of repair work that needs that needs to be done. Uh, but social practice, as I said, I keep going back to like the community garden. You know, we have a lot of food deserts in Charlotte. You know, what about working, you know, with, I, I think you don't want to be like the great people that, you know, I have the solution. You need to, it needs to kind of come from the community. You need to have like real, serious engagements with them. It can't just be surface. You, um, you would want to make relationships with the community organization or with a, you know, if it's a religious community that sometimes is where people um, congregate and come together. Um, basically to do any social practice work, it has to be real and authentic. You can't be like the artist coming in, like I have the solution and this is what you need to do. That's the absolute wrong way to do it. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, very much so. Thank you very much, and and, and, and providing actual examples is very helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Carla. I really, really appreciate all the time, all the presentation points you made, extremely mm -hmm. educational and helpful. And I would like to remind everybody that on this page, Carla is providing it's actually Arts and Science Council website and Arts and Science Council public art website, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, a great source for uh, um, public art opportunity listings. So place where you can actually right. learn about opportunities and very often they are vary from a few thousand dollars projects to obviously a few hundred or a couple million dollars. But um, this is kind of a good place to start. Yeah, and as we do um, the capacity building workshops, I'll definitely let you know, uh, Marek, so that you can share it with your students right. in case they want to tune in. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. I hope you all have a nice weekend. Enjoy yes. my time with you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.